Hey everybody, in today's video we're talking about how a failed short film I did in college years later ended up paving the way for me to be able to get a grant with the Montana Film Commission and be able to make it again the right way. For those who are interested in knowing about this process, I'm documenting this film that I'm shooting on 16mm film as a first time filmmaker doing this on film. And you can check out other videos on my channel of me talking about that process, of my test shoot that I did. You can check that out at my first time ever shooting on film with my brother Alex who's DPing this project. But as I'm getting to create more videos about this short film, I just realized it might be helpful for anyone watching if they wanted to, to be able to get a little bit more of the backstory of this film. A little more insight to where it came from, why I decided to make it in the first place, and maybe give you a little more insight on some of the characters, the setting, the genre, and stuff like that. Let's just rewind six years back to when this all started. So I was out on a fishing trip with my dad. We were coming back from this trip and we looked out into this area where there was a homestead, an abandoned cabin. My dad was mentioning to me how it was on public land and because of that, it was actually, it would have been really easy for me as a student filmmaker to go on that property and go shoot something there if I was so interested. Sometimes you have to kind of go off of what you have already accessible to you. What is really abundant in Idaho is the wilderness. <laughs> We've got Yellowstone not far from us. That's kind of what people know of and so naturally, I just kind of thought of it would be really interesting to do a piece that was centered around this this empty cabin that was built in the 1800s and kind of like in that western setting. I had this real love and fascination with stories that involved single characters, not only because they're very easy and cheap to make, but they're a lot more intriguing for me as a storytelling device. You look at Pixar, Wally is like kind of a one character story. Survivor movies like All Is Lost, Cast Away, Locke with Tom Hardy, and even more popular movies that I remember even younger watching like I Am Legend where it was mostly one guy trying to survive out in this urban jungle. So I thought it would be a great first short film for me I, that was ready to take a little more seriously and not have to worry as much about complex dialogue scenes and just keeping it really easy to do. And Alex and I just realized that we wanted to get something we could get in like in a day or two and not have to worry about just trying to wrangle people all the time when you have no budget to pay them to do anything. So I naturally thought about utilizing that kind of one character piece paired up with this location of this empty abandoned cabin. I thought it'd be really cool to create a almost a coming home story. I thought it'd be really interesting this character was trying to get home to this cabin. That was about it. Didn't really have much more plot to that. I was nearing graduation and I was required to do a what they call a senior project. And so I decided with the senior project, this would be a great opportunity for my brother and I to try to get this little short film utilizing the beautiful landscapes of Idaho and doing kind of a, a Western type of story. I kind of worked together the script and I ended up adding a little, couple more details to the story that I thought were any, even more exciting. I was playing with time and making it a little bit more psychological and less just about a guy lost wandering in the woods. What if every time this person traveling in the woods in the 1800s kind of stumbled upon this empty campsite that was perfectly made and, and but no one was around in it. The campsite kind of actually played a larger role than the actual cabin itself um, as this guy's lost but kind of re returning to this camp over and over again and whether or not he's lost or if he's kind of in some sort of strange time loop thing was kind of up to the audience to decide. Kind of went from just period survivor story it kind of migrated into almost like a psychological drama in a sense which are my favorite movies so it, it naturally kind of went down that path a little bit. So we gave ourselves two days to shoot this film. Now I look back, that's kind of crazy to think about. I think at the time it was an 11 page script, but that was more or less because we had such a little budget. Everyone helping me on this film, we were like other students who had classes and had jobs. It was really hard to get people together and to be there all at once to make this thing happen without having to pay people. That's just what we had to do, was just really crank through those two days and try to get it done. During this same time while I was in college, I was super interested in um, anamorphic lenses and how they made images look. I was absolutely fascinated with it. For those that don't know anamorphic lenses, what they do is basically take your image, squash it when you're filming it to its more narrow, and then they unsquash it to make it an even more wide aspect ratio, like a wide, more wider screen format. Most films in Hollywood from the 50s on, when they invented these types of lenses, that's how they achieved 
back in the day, those real, that really cool widescreen aesthetic. Most movies that we know today and that cinematic look comes from the anamorphic lenses and that's just how it's just been baked into our psyche ever since. What filmmakers do now is, and I've even done this in films, is you just crop your image. You know, you add in the black bars and you're not doing anything different with your actual lenses or the way that the image is stretched. But when you shoot things anamorphically, you're actually not cutting off any of those pixels. You're just stretching your image wider so that the lens sees wider than a normal spherical lens or like the lens this is here sees. And the only way that you can achieve that is uh, basically one way which is to get anamorphic lenses, which if you look at the cost of anamorphic lenses today are the cheapest ones are still probably thousands of dollars. The real good ones, the real cinema, cinema anamorphic lenses are in the tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars at times and they are just completely unavailable for guys like me in college to get my hands on. But there is one um, hack that you can do, and maybe those are know where I'm going with this. You can use what are called projection lenses. And a projection lens is not an actual cinema lens that you use on your camera. It's a lens that goes on the old 35 millimeter projectors that use the same prints back in the day before we had all digital cinemas. And so in theory, you can use that same lens to shoot you can get that same effect. So I called a local theater nearby. Lo and behold, they had a couple of these that just were lying around collecting dust and they sold them to me for $40 each. So I got two of them and I was super excited to find them. And this is one of them. This is the one we actually used. It's the Cine Navitar is what it's called. It's pretty honky, it's huge, it's heavy. But the cool thing about it is it, I'm not doing any trickery here. You see how it's kind of a narrow stretch there. If I flip it around exactly, it goes to a wide stretch. See how that works? Pretty cool, right? These lenses are really exciting. It was really fun to get my hands on these. And we decided once we got, once I got a hold of one of these, my brother and I were like, okay, let's shoot this thing anamorphic. This is going to be something that sets us apart. It's going to feel different. We're going to get the really cool cinematic, epic widescreen look for literally $40. These are not meant to be, to go on a DSLR like I'm shooting on right now. And that's what we were shooting this film on. So we had to buy this clamp here that I got on, I think on eBay. Uh, for probably 20 like fifteen dollars something like that um, We got some diopters to help with you know focusing closer because this thing does not focus less than like 30 feet Because it's meant to be on a wall and in a in a theater. It's just not meant to be Used like we were intending to use it. So we had to find ways to kind of work around it And I'll talk about what that looked like and how difficult that was when we actually shot <laughs> this short film but we had our we had our look we did some tests we really were excited about how it was turning out on the test that we did and we were ready to get this thing in the can and start filming it. Now for the crew and for the actor in this, I only had a couple characters in this film um, and the lead was played by my cousin Nelson who was not a you know traditionally trained actor, uh, wasn't even a theater student, he was literally actually a pre-med student at the time and he was, he was just about to head to medical school in Des Moines, Illinois. But we had a couple weeks before he had to head out to get this thing in the can. And we did our best to shoot this thing. And we got some things that look great and some things that were exciting. Some of the things still today as I look back at this, some of the shots we got, I think are really impressive considering we had literally zero dollars and cents uh, put toward this film besides just a few pieces that I bought to make it actually, to actually film this. It was a tiny window to shoot this thing. And the fact that we were shooting it on this bad boy, trying to get every shot as we could in camera, uh, shooting anamorphic, because we didn't want to shoot spherical too, we want to keep it 100% anamorphic, um, really was proved to be a problem for us. Um, anytime we had to do a close up in this film, it, it was very nightmarish. Not only are you focusing this giant piece of equipment, but you're also focusing your taken lens, the lens that's attached to this, your main lens. And then we also had to put on like diopters in the front to help us get even closer, because anything within like, eight feet or five feet, it was out of focus and it was impossible to focus because it's just not meant to focus that close. And as you know, shooting a film, we had a ton of close-ups in this story. There's a lot of visual, you know, shots that where there's a lot of like him looking in chests and looking at stuff. And so just the close-ups were insanely difficult. And um, Alex very quickly let me know of how bad of an idea this was probably that we try to shoot it all. Uh, even now looking back, if we didn't have to shoot it on this, it probably would have been really hard to get it on the can uh, in two days because we had so little time. We did everything naturally lit. We didn't do any like artificial lighting. Um, I don't even think we bounced or did any negative fill. It was literally just 
shooting whatever in the canopy in the forest and just having that be the way it looked naturally is the way it was lit ended up running out of time we probably got 80 percent of the film in the can the 20 percent that we missed was kind of an important 20 percent i would say once you look at your dailies once you kind of like get it all back and you're kind of reviewing it that's when you kind of see the flaws and you see the, the issues and we saw how much was kind of focus and there's a lot of vignetting going on in this every shot we had was like had a big old vignette around the edge because it's just we had all these diopters and the matte box and it's, it was just so difficult to use our cage was falling apart all the time that we had mounted because we had cheap gear we ended up not being able to finish it completely. After the matter of this, like I said, Nelson, who was the lead actor, was going to medical school in a matter of weeks, and it was almost impossible to get him back into costume to the forest. There was one time I finally got Nelson to get back. I got the costume and rented it out again. I was able to get him and another DP friend of mine, his name is Mason, and we went up to the mountains to try to get some extra pieces just to see if we could strap together the story. And then, then the act of God happened where when we got up there as we drove, it started snowing. <laughs> Again, th it kind of threw my hands up in the air. I was like, man, I don't think I'm supposed to finish this film. I think this is just kind of going to have to be done and we're going to have to just call it a really fun experiment with the anamorphic projection lens and just kind of move on from there. I was able to finish my senior project and get good grades for it. I was only supposed to showcase something that I did. And so I uh, essentially created a trailer for this, this concept film that I did. That was the end of it. I ended up graduating, uh, getting into starting my own business, kind of moving completely away from like the narrative and filmmaking world for a bit. And this film just kind of like, I wanted to forget it. I wanted to, to just go away and me to think of a new project that would come and be more interesting to me, but it kept me up at night. It was torturing me. It was kind of haunting me all the time and I just could not put it away. One day I was talking to a friend of mine who helped me on this film. So I showed it to him and he was excited to see, you know, what it looked like, how it turned out. And, and as I was kind of explaining, I was like, well, you know, I kind of want to like finish it. I feel like we should maybe try to wrangle the band back together again and see if we can just get those pieces and just get it done. And he told me something I didn't expect from him. He just looked at me and was like, no, Tanner, I think you should do it all again and do it right. <laughs> He's not a filmmaking guy at all. And so for him to say, I think you should do the story the way that you intended it to be and, 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 and the way that you saw it in the first place. In the end, I knew he was right. I knew that that was what needed to happen. And I said, okay, we're gonna push this guy out and be done with it and I'm going to start again. I'm gonna go back to the script and we're gonna see if we can resurrect this project and do it right, whatever that meant. There, there are very limited amounts of financing and, and initiatives for filmmakers in Idaho. There's zero dollars they give out for the Film Commission here. However, Montana is a nearby neighbor state and, and I had always known about the Big Sky Grant. Everyone has a chance to get this grant. For the Big Sky Grant, you are required to shoot at least half of the film in Montana. And then the other thing is that the story and the theme and the type of movie needs to be a quote unquote Montana story. And this is the only film that I felt like was a Montana story that I had on my plate. So I thought, I'll just see. Maybe I'll just submit an application for this story. Maybe that's the way for me to do it right, to have a budget behind it. Other thing too that I talked about with Alex is we had tried the anamorphic thing. We had tried shooting it in a new format that we'd never done before and it challenged us. The next thing that we wanted to do if we ever to get a budget behind it would be shooting on 16 millimeter film. And that was kind of the goal of ours. In order to do that, we had to get a budget. We had to have money behind this project in order for us to, to make it. And so we kind of made that pact saying, hey, if we are able to get this grant, then we're gonna do it on film. That's the way we're gonna go about it. I was trying many ways to make this feel as Montana as possible. So I had to re I had to think of a new title for my film. And as I was doing research about Montana, there's a dormant volcano called Lone Mountain. And that name really stuck with me. And I thought that was very reminiscent of this story. It's about a individual who is alone in this wilderness and is surrounded by mountains. It just stuck with me and I renamed on my application now what I'm calling it as Lone Mountain. I submitted my application, I showed the trailer, I did you know, a, a kind of write up, I showed all the storyboards I had, the script obviously. I felt like it was a pretty solid application and I sent it out to them. Probably three or four months went by and I did not hear anything back from them until one day I checked my voicemail and I noticed I had two or three calls from a Montana number and then suddenly just, I just remembered, 
what if that's the Film Commission? Hey, this is Stacy Zylak from the Film Commission, and I'd like to talk to you about your application for the film grant. Hurrying call him right afterward. I'm like, oh my gosh. Kind of expecting that it might be like, hey, sorry, we liked your stuff, but we're not gonna, you know, be able to give you any money for the grant, or whatever. But as I talked to her, literally the words came out. We'd like to let you know that we are happy to grant Lone Mountain $10,000 to be made. And we really liked your application. We're really excited about the story. And I was over the moon excited. I, I was breathing heavily on the phone. That was it, the beginning of it. Okay, we have $10,000 and we can we can start this process. That's how I got to this point now, posting videos on YouTube talking about this little short film called Lone Mountain. Ended up kind of coming full circle again to where that original film has paved the way for the film I'm making now and actually have a budget behind it. And so I do want to kind of share three points uh, for creatives, for filmmakers, Never feel like a project you work on, you really invest your part of your life into, no matter how it pans out, good or bad. Never feel like any project is a failed project. Just the experience alone and the things you learn from it and what you build from that always ends up proving to be a lesson and you gain a lot of value from that than you ever would if not trying at all. Uh, I think a big part of my application was that I had shot previously all of this stuff. I wasn't just sending them a treatment or a script or a log line. I had Literally in the can, 80% of my film, and I shot it anamorphically so it helped elevate the the look and the feel of this project. I had storyboards, I had concept art, I had lookbooks, and, and they were able to trust me and saying, hey, he's got, I, we like what this is looking like and how it feels. Let's give him some money to, to maybe do it the right way. Always show your vision when you want to get something made. Always show, don't tell. Not everybody's a visual person who can see it in their head when you tell them an idea. There's a lot of great tools today in the world you can use, um, even like AI that can help you really flesh out concepts. And that's, that's gonna be hands down more valuable than just giving them a, a log line or a script to read because it's just, it's more work for them. You need to just, you gotta knock their socks off visually. And then the last thing that I learned was to trust your inner voice. Whatever you wanna call it, your conscience, your inner voice, intuition, your gut feeling, trust that. I do believe that that inner voice that you have needs to be followed and it needs to be trusted. In this case, I wanted to put this story away. I wanted to be done with it and not have to worry about it anymore and just chalk it off as a failed project. I had that feeling deep within me saying, no, don't leave it alone bring it back, resurrect it. You're not done with this project yet. Luckily, I had my friend who helped, who really did that, gave me a little bit of a spur to move forward again and, and try something new because I had I had needed that. Give or take for what you will, this is the story of Lone Mountain. This is where it started from. This is where I'm at now. I just wrapped on production, now going into post-production. I'm excited to share with you guys of how it went. There was there are so many stories that I, I'm excited to make videos about to tell you what happened on actually making this and attempting to shoot this thing on film with a very little to no budget and uh, kind of my first debut on a, on a much bigger project that I am writing and directing. So if you wanna come along for the journey, subscribe so that you don't miss out on the next video I post on this. And if this is the one video you're, you're gonna watch, hopefully you learned a few things like I did from this. Thanks for watching.